Okay, so this video is going to be on a concept called limiting reactants. And what a limiting reactant is, is when we have like two reactants, <clears throat> we always have one that's a limiting reactant and one that's an excess reactant. So the limiting reactant is the reactant in the chemical reaction that's completely used up during the reaction. So it limits the amount of product that can be formed. Once that limiting reactant runs out, the reaction stops, and the amount of product formed is right there. That's as much that can be, um, that can be produced. You'll have some excess reactant left over. There'll always be you know, an excess reactant and a limiting reactant. So the excess reactant is the reactant in the chemical reaction that remains after reaction ends. So after reaction ends, you know, you have your product, but you also have some of your excess reactant mixed in there with your, you know, product that you would have to separate, you know, using some uh, procedure to separate from your product always, you know, with a chemical reaction. Now, if we look at, if we have bicycles, and if you have four bicycle bodies, you have 12 bicycle wheels, that would produce four bicycles, you know, but you would have four wheels remaining, you know, because you have enough wheels, if you have 12 bicycle wheels, you can make six bicycles. However, you can't make that many because you only have four bicycle bodies. So what's the limiting reactant in the example above? It is the bodies, the bicycle bodies. They limit how much of how many bicycles you can make. The excess reactant would be the wheels, because you really have, there'll be some of those left over. You know, it's the same concept with, you know, making a compound or making a product in a chemical reaction. Um, there's so far, if we look at a simple chemical reaction, if I look at like salt, how salt would be made, if I have, you know, the balanced equation for that is 2Na plus 1Cl2 plus chlorine produces NaCl or 2NaCl. You know, these numbers are in moles. That's 2 moles of sodium plus 1 mole of chlorine produces 2 moles of NaCl. That's the basic lowest um, uh, ratio of numbers of moles to moles. So if you have two moles of Na, you can get two moles of NaCl. You know, but those are just ratios that we use to convert from moles to, of one substance to moles of another. Well, what we've done so far is we said, hey, in a problem, if you have 10 grams of sodium, how much sodium chloride in grams can be produced? And that's a three-step problem. Like the three-step stoichiometry problems we've been working, the grams to grams stoichiometry. We have to first convert to moles and then we have to convert from moles of Na to moles of NaCl. And then finally, we have to convert to grams of NaCl. But what we're going to be doing now is we're going to say, well, how about if we had 10 grams of sodium and we have 10 grams of chlorine gas? How much NaCl could be produced? And which one of those would be the limiting reactant? Which one of them uh, is going to run out first, the 10 grams of sodium or the 10 grams of chlorine. And so what we're doing, there's nothing new in these types of problems we're working. The thing what we'd have to do is to work out, we'd have to go, well, I've got 10 grams of sodium, how much grams of NaCl would be produced? I would have to work that problem, and then I would have to also work it again with chlorine. If I had 10 grams of chlorine, how many grams of NaCl could be produced? Now I'm gonna have two answers in grams of NaCl. Which one would be the correct one if I work this problem? Well, the lowest amount, if I work this in grams of NaCl would be the correct answer because, and whatever reactant produced that amount would be my limiting reactant because once that limiting reactant runs out, the reaction stops and that's all the grams of NaCl that could be produced. So I'm just going to throw some hypothetical numbers out there. Let's say if I did 10 grams of Na and I went to grams of NaCl, which I'm not going to work this problem, I'm going to work another one in just a minute, but just hypothetically, 
and let's say that produced uh, 7 grams of NaCl. And let's say I did the same problem with 10 grams of Cl2 and I went to grams of NaCl and a th three-step stoichiometry problem, and let's say that it produced 8 grams. Which one of these would be my correct answer? Well, the lowest one would be my correct answer, 7 grams, and Na, sodium, would be my limiting reactant in this case, if that was the you know, correct numbers of grams of NaCl produced. The lowest amount would be correct, it would be 7 grams, Na would be my limiting reactant, because 8 grams could not be produced because chlorine would not be my limiting reactant in this case, as it produced more than what the sodium did. So with that being said, we're going to look at, and you should have this handout right here, we're going to look at this ex a couple example problems. The first one's going to be this one right here. A 2 gram sample of NH3 is mixed with 4 grams of O2. Find how many grams of H2O can be produced, and B, what is, which is the linear reactant. So note, calculate the mass in grams of H2O that is produced from each reactant. The linear reactant would be the one that produces the smallest amount of H2O, and the smallest amount of H2O is the maximum number of grams that can be produced. Now, keep in mind, when we work these problems, we are doing this theoretically. We're not in the lab doing this. The numbers that we get will be like the maximum amount that can be produced. If we do this in the lab, more likely we're not going to get quite that amount because we'll lose some of our product, we'll not add quite the amount of, of uh, the, you know, we weigh out things, our, our instruments are a little bit off and stuff like that. So we'll not get exactly what we can come up with theoretically on paper, but, you know, the idea is to get as close as possible when you do the, when you do a lab and try to produce these in the, these products in the lab. So if we look at this problem and I have it on another page where I can, um, uh, uh, right here is the same problem where I can work it out and have more room. Now these problems take a lot of room, so you might, when you do the worksheets, you might want to do them on your own paper, or you know if you write big or something like that. If not, you can do it. All. I'll probably left enough room on the uh, for you to do it on the worksheets. But this nothing new about these problems. It's three step stoichiometry problems. We just have to work it for both reactants. So what it tells me is I have 2.00 grams of NH3. So it's telling me I got 2.00 grams of this. And it's mixed with 4.00 grams of O2. So I got 4.00 grams of O2. And it asks how many grams of H2O, so I want to go to grams of H2O, can be produced. So i got to work this problem for both reactants. If I was just given the mass of one reactant, it would just be a normal three-step stoichiometry problem. However, since I'm given the mass of both reactants, I have to figure out which one actually limits the amount of product being produced. Now, keep in mind the balanced equation is like a recipe that we use, you know, a basic recipe, and we can uh, use that to go from moles of one substance to moles of another substance. Now, to work the problem first, I'm going to start with the 2.00 grams of NH3. That's ammonium. So, first, I'm going to work it, this problem, and it'll probably take me a couple pages. So, I'm going to work it for 2.00 grams of NH3 first. And I'm going to see how much I get. Now, like I said, this is a three-step stoichiometry problem. We've already done enough of these problems, enough stuff where you should know the three steps in working grams to grams stoichiometry. The very first step is I'm going to take what's given to me in grams. I'm going to divide it by the molar mass because I want to convert it to moles. I cannot work in grams. I cannot go from grams of NH3 to grams of H2O in one step. I can't because I have to use my balance equation. My balance equation is in moles, so I got to be in moles in the beginning. So I got 2.00 grams of NH3. I'm going to divide it by the molar mass. Now, when you add the molar mass of NH3, and like I said, you're going to have to do that on all these, I have them written down here. I would work out your molar masses first. That way you can just work through the problem. Uh, and you could probably do them by now. You probably do them in your calculator without even having to write down the molar masses. You just need to double check them because if you miss these molar masses, you're going to miss these problems. 
Of course, N, you know, there's one of those times 14.01, I believe. Hydrogen, you have three of those times um, three of those times uh, 1.01 or maybe nitrogen is 14.00 three times 1.01 and when you multiply those out you get 14.00 plus 3.03 .03, which will give you 17.03 is the molar mass of NH3 now you got to keep up with these molar masses that what you work out where you don't get them mixed up with what you're working with. So first I want to divide by the molar mass of NH3. I figured it up. We should know how to do molar mass by now. We've been doing it for, you know, a month now. We did it all in the last unit. Everybody made, most people did very well on the test, so I assume you know how to do this. So 17.03 or 17.04, if, you know, if you're a tenth off on the molar mass, it's not gonna make a difference. So I'm going to bring up my calculator, and when I take 2 divided by 17.03, I get, and I can round this to two decimal places, 0 .0, 0 0.0.117, I can round that to 0 0.12, and now I'm in moles of NH3. All I did is convert to moles. My first step, simply divide by the molar mass. I do not use those coefficients, but on the second step, when I'm going from moles of one substance to moles of another substance. So if I look at my second step, I want to go from moles of NH3. I'm trying to find grams of H2O, so first I got to go from moles of NH3. I got to do that. I got to go to moles of H2O first, and I use my balanced equation. I'm going to use my coefficients to do that. Now I have, you know, I look for the coefficient that's in front of NH3, which is 4. So I'm going to put 4 over what I actually have, which is 0.12, equals, I look at the coefficient of what I'm going to, which is 6 in front of H2O, so it be 6 over X. And so when I cross multiply, I get 4X equals... Maybe 0 0.12 times 6 equals 0 0.72. I divide both sides by 4. And my x is going to be 0 0.18. Now I'm simply in moles of H2O. I went from moles of NH3 to moles of H2O using my bounce equation. My last step is to simply convert to grams of H2O. So I take 0.18, multiply it by the molar mass of H2O. So when you add up the molar masses of H2O, the molar mass will be 18.02. And that will give me my grams. So 0.18 times 18.02 gives me 3.24 grams of H2O. So that's how much I would get if I had started with 2 grams of NH3. However, um, this problem, I got to work it now. I got to turn around and work the problem all over again for 4 grams of H of O2. So I'm going to get another page and now I'm still doing this for 4.00 grams of O2 and I want to work it and go to grams of H2O again. So my first step simply again is to convert grams to moles. So 4.00 divided by the molar mass this time of O2 the molar mass of oxygen is 16.00, so times 2 would be 32.00. So that's 4 divided by 32 equals 0. 0.2 decimal places would be 0. 0.13. 
and that is moles of O2. My next step is to use my balanced equation to go from moles of O2 to moles of H2O. So I look and the coefficient in front of O2 was a 5. So that would be 5 over 0 0.13 equals the coefficient in front of H2O again is 6. So that is 6 over X. I cross multiply. That equals 5X equals 0.13 times 6 equals 0 0.78. I divide both sides by 5, and my answer in moles of ocean is 0 0.16, but two decimal places, that would be moles. Now I'm in moles of H2O. Last step is I need to convert to grams of H2O, simply then Multiply by the molar mass of H2O, which again I've already found was 18.02. So 0.16 times 18.02 equals 2.88 grams of H2O. So in my first answer, From this page here, whenever NH3 was used, I got 3.24 grams. So whenever NH3 was used, I got 3.24 grams of H2O. Whenever I used O2, my, that reactant, I got 2.88 grams of H2O. So what's my correct answer? As we said, the limiting reactant or the amount of product produced is the one with the smallest amount produced, so that would be this one. So my correct answer of grams of H2O produced would be 2.88. The limiting reactant would be O2. So there's nothing new about these problems. We've already worked three-step problems, you know, grams to gram stoichiometry. You just have to work it for both reactants. Once you get your answers, you compare the two answers. The lowest amount is the correct answer, and the reactant that produced that lowest amount is your limiting reactant. All right, so we're going to look at one more. And this is a sample problem. If you look back in your notes, let me see, 4.95. Okay, this is number two. If you look at the practice problems that are part of the guiding notes, this is number two that I'm going to work. Just to work one more, make sure everybody understands what they're doing. And this problem says, if 4.95 grams of ethylene, C2H4, are combusted, that means reacted with, 3.25 grams of O2, find A, how many grams of CO2 can be produced, and what is the limiting reactant? Now, if this didn't tell me like what product to go to, if this didn't ask how many grams of CO2 can be produced, all I'd ask was what was my limiting reactant, I could pick either product, CO2 or H2O, and go to grams of that and compare. But since it's asking me how many grams of CO2 are produced, then I'm going to go to grams of CO2. But if it wasn't for that case, I could pick any product and find the number of grams and then compare them to see what the correct limiting reactant was. But anyway, so this problem, it tells me I have 4.95 grams of C2H4. I got 3.25 grams of O2, and I want to go to grams of CO2. So first, I'm going to work this problem for my first reactant. So I'm going to work it for 4.95 grams of C2H4. So I'm going to go from that, 2 grams of CO2. It's a three-step stoichiometry problem. So my first step, simply take 
convert it to moles. 4.95 grams of C2H4. If I find the molar mass of C2H4 and I add it up, two carbons, two times the atomic mass of carbon plus four times the atomic mass of hydrogen, you add all those up, it should be 28.05. I've already calculated these just to save time on these videos because and I've assumed that you already know how to calculate molar mass. If you don't, you really need to ask you know a classmate get with them and work on these problems and i don't mind if you work on these problems together you know and help one another because they are challenging you know we're combining a lot of stuff we've learned stoichiometry is in itself everything we've worked for all year we're trying to get to this point where we can do these types of problems so if i take 4.95 divided by 28.05 to convert it to moles, so 4.95 divided by 28.05, I get 0 0.18 to two decimal places, 0 0.18, and I'm in moles of C2H4. So my second step is I want to go from moles of C2H4 to moles of CO2. And my balanced equation, you know, there's a coefficient 1 in front of C2H4, so that would be 1 over how many moles I actually have, which is 0 0.18 equals I'm going to moles of CO2. The coefficient from CO2 is 2, so that'd be 2 over x. If you notice what I'm doing, every time one mole reacts, you get two moles. One mole of C2H4 reacts, you get two moles. Well, what I want to know is when I got 0.18 moles, how many moles I get, and that's what that x is going to tell me. That's why I said that's why I'm able to set this proportion where I can cross multiply. If I cross multiply. I get 1x equals 0 0.36, divide both sides by 1, and my x, now I've went to, from moles of uh, C2H4 to moles of CO2, my product. My last step, now I can convert the third step is simply convert to grams. 0.36 moles of CO2. I want to multiply it by the molar mass of CO2. The molar mass, if you add up CO2, is 44.01. So 0.36 times 44.01 gives me 15.84. And that will be grams of CO2. So if I'm going, if I have 4.95 grams of C2H4, that'll give me 15.84 grams of CO2, theoretically. That's doing it on paper. That's not doing it in the lab. We'll talk about more about that later on. Now I gotta turn around and work the same problem if I have 3.25 grams O2. So I'm gonna go to another page. If I have now I'm going to work the same problem for 3.25 grams of O2. Make sure that's right, yes. So again, my first step, simply convert that to moles. 3.25 grams of O2 divided by the molar mass of O2. Again, atomic mass of oxygen 16, 16 times 2 would give me 32.00. So I take 3.25 divided by 32 gives me 0 0.10. Now I'm in moles of O2. My next step. I gotta go from moles of O2 to moles of CO2. So I look, the coefficient in front of O2 in this reaction is a four. So I'll put four over the actual moles that I have, which is 0 0.10 equals 
coefficient in front of, I'm going to CO2 is a 2, so that will be 2 over x. When I cross multiply, I get 4x equals 0.1 times 2. Well, I should have known that's so 0.2. Divide both sides by 4 to solve for x. x is 0 0.05. Now I've just went to from moles of O2 to moles of CO2. My last step, and I should have wrote that as step 2 right there, so step 3. This is step 3. Is simply convert to grams. So I got 0 0.05 times the molar mass of CO2, which is 44.01. And I get 2.2, .2, and that is grams of CO2. So when I work this problem, I got that whenever O2 was the reactant. I get 2.2 grams of CO2. When, if I look back at what I just calculated, when C2H4 was the uh, reactant, I got 15.84 grams. So when C2H4, I got 15.84 grams of CO2. What's the correct answer? The one that is the smallest amount. So the smallest amount is 2.2 grams of CO2. That'd be my correct answer. What reactant produced that amount? O2 did. So O2 would be my limiting reactant. Now these problems are long. You're having to work pretty much two stoichiometry problems in one. So take your time. When you're calculating, if I was you, when you first look at a problem like this, go ahead and look and go ahead and calculate your molar masses. You know, like what I did up here, you know, make sure you write down what they are though. You know, this first one was C2H4, this was O2, this was CO2, this was C2H4. Go ahead and calculate those molar masses you're gonna need, then you can fly, go through the problem a lot quicker. So again, Work the problem, three-step stoichiometry problem for both reactants. Compare the amount of grams produced, and uh, the one with the smaller amount will be the correct amount produced. Whatever reactant produced that smaller amount will be your limiting reactant. The other one is your excess reactant, which means when you do this reaction, once the 3.25 grams of O2 reacts with the uh, 4.95 grams of C2, H4. Once the O2 runs out, there'll be 2.2 grams of CO2 produced and the reaction will stop. This amount here, the 15.84, will never be produced. You'll never get that amount because once this amount gets produced, the reaction will stop. You will have excess. All your O2 will be used up, but you will have excess C2H4 and it will be mixed in with your carbon dioxide, you would have to, you know, separate these things. Usually when you have two liquids, you would have to separate them with, you know, uh, with some procedure to separate your uh, excess reactant from your product and purify your, your product. But that's basically what limiting reactants are. Now, if we look at stoichiometry and we look at, uh, you know, just real quickly to, to tell you what we've... Um, kind of did this whole year working backwards is now with stoichiometry you have learned that you know if you were working in a lab or for a company and their job is producing you know a chemical if you are off with stoichiometry and cannot predict how much product is produced or how much reactant you know uh, you need to produce a certain amount of product you're not going to keep a job very long. Also, the goal is, when you have a reactant, you're always going to have a limited reactant. It is impossible to get to where your reactants run out at the same time. 
So usually what you do is you make reactions and the amounts you use for reactions, you want your more expensive chemical to be your limiting reactant. You don't want to have excess of it because you will lose money. You want your cheaper chemical to be your excess reactant. You also want to figure out the amounts of reactants to produce a certain amount of product where you don't have much excess. If you have excess reactant, you lose money if you can't reuse it. So you can kind of, you know, mess around with stoichiometry to figure out <clears throat> how much uh, you know, of your limiting reactant and excess reactant you would need to where you'll have the little amount of waste as possible and you would save money and, and make the company you work for as much money as possible. That's kind of the goal of stoichiometry. So we learned in the last unit how to find molar masses and how to convert grams to moles because in stoichiometry problems, again, you know, our first step is simply to convert to moles. And we do that by dividing by the molar mass. Our second step was to go from moles of whatever you start with, which we call moles of your given, to moles of your unknown or moles of what you want. And you do that by using the balanced equation. You use those coefficients. That's the only time you use coefficients, where you're going from moles of one substance, if you're going from moles of Na to moles of NaCl, then you would use these coefficients here. So that's why we need a balanced equation. So really our first step always is to make sure we have a balanced equation, which I've given you most of them. Otherwise, these problems would be very, very long, which we already know how to find the balanced reaction. Last step is to convert to grams. And you do that by multiplying by your molar mass. So once you have your answer for number two, you would just do number three by converting to grams. So this is all stuff we learned in the last unit. We learned in unit five how to balance reactions, because that's important. We have to have a balanced reaction to do these. We learned in unit four how to name compounds. We be able to recognize what this stuff is, like sodium and Chlorine and you know sodium chloride is an ionic compound. We also learned how to write formulas. We wrote you know sodium is a plus one, chlorine is a minus one. Cross those, you get NaCl. That's the correct formula for that. It's an ionic compound. It means they share electrons when they bond, or they or excuse me, they transfer electrons. In a covalent compound, they share electrons. So you have to kind of understand all this. You have to understand something about atoms and you know chemical changes and stuff that we learned in unit two, because this is what a chemical reaction is, a chemical change, you're producing a new substance. So what we're doing in unit seven is something we've learned the whole year, and you have to kind of understand all that to be able to do it. So if you really understand this, you're doing very well. If you're struggling, you need to go back and watch my videos uh, when we first started talking about this stuff, or otherwise you're really gonna struggle on the test that we will have uh, next week. So there will be a quiz. Uh, once you, now your assignment is to do these other example problems. All right, so you'll do the rest of these. Uh, you can check your answers tomorrow. We will have a big quiz on this stuff on Friday. So make sure that you learn how to do this stuff. Message me if you have any more problems. But go back and watch my videos and watch them again if you have to, to, to understand this and work with your classmates. Uh, I don't mind if you check answers and help one another with this.